What do sexism, classism, ableism, racism, genderism, and elitism all have in common? These are systems of oppression. Culturally, we as a people are learning to get better at listening to the lived experiences of victims of oppression, which is really important work. What we have spent less time and energy doing is digging into the source of that oppression. Contrary to popular belief, oppression itself is not a source, it's an outcome. It's an outcome or a symptom of domination. What is domination? Quite simply, domination is the corruption of power. Let's back up for a moment. Human power itself is good. We all use power all the time to make decisions, to drive our car, to work in the morning, to brush our teeth, to write books, to make art, to pass laws. Let's borrow from the world of community organizing for a moment to define power as the ability to make any kind of change in the world. Power is both personal and collective. I, the me, and we, the people. We all use power. We all have power, though society grants more to some than to others. Now, while human power is good in its healthiest form, what sometimes happens is we get overly attached to power. We begin to lust after it, to hoard it. And that is the point when power shape shifts into its nasty cousin, domination. Domination is fully self-serving. It will seek its own way at the expense of others. It fails to empathize, it wants to rule, it wants to control. It will use force or violence or punishment to get its way and it will try to look good doing it. Domination hates to be held accountable because if it's held accountable, it will be forced to share and it's allergic to sharing. Domination is the enemy of human flourishing. Now at this point, you may be thinking of a stereotypical bully or narcissist who pushes other people around to get their way, and certainly bullies use domination. But what I would like to talk about today is the fact that because domination hates to be held accountable, domination likes to hide. Domination hides in the ways we relate to each other on an interpersonal basis, and domination hides in the systems and institutions of our culture and society. It hides in mass incarceration and in gender-based violence. It hides in corporate greed and in predatory capitalism. It hides in environmental pillaging and in healthcare systems and in the nonprofit industrial complex. It hides in empire building and it hides in microaggressions. Since the dawn of human history, humans have been inventing ways to harbor domination. When domination hides, it uses mechanisms of control that I like to call masks, just like you or I would wear a mask on our face. Here are some of the masks that domination likes to use. Anonymity, pretending to be nameless and invisible so that it can't be confronted. Benevolence, presenting itself as one of the good guys who couldn't possibly be in the wrong. Fragility, claiming that if it's held accountable, it will be harmed. Civility, weaponizing niceness so it can control the rules and prioritize itself. And gaslighting, pretending that the real problem is the person confronting it. How do these masks play out in real life? Let's illustrate with a story. So it's 45 minutes after work and you're running late to meet a friend. You walk out to the parking lot and you see someone slam into your car and park and try to walk away. So with all the courage you can muster, you run after this person, you say, hey, excuse me, you hit my car. No, I didn't, he says. But I literally watched you hit my car and try to walk away. Can you please give me your insurance information? It wasn't me, he replies. But but your car has red scratches on it and my red car has a dent. All evidence points to you hitting my car. You must have me confused with someone else, he says. Now at this point, 
you don't want to pay for the damage out of pocket, so you decide to call the police because surely they will fix this. The police show up and take one look at the person who hit you and say, hey, it's Bob. How's it going, Bob? And before you can get a word in edgewise, Bob proceeds to tell the officers that you were being aggressive toward him. You try to explain what happened, but the police officers interrupt you and say, Bob's a good guy. You need to get back in your car and leave. Now at this point, you just spoke to the people who were supposed to protect you from the Bobs of the world, and they failed you. You have no other recourse but to leave. Now a week later, you're driving down the street, and you see that guy Bob walking on the sidewalk, and you decide to pull over and confront him. Excuse me, why? Why would you tell those officers I was being aggressive? That was totally unfair. You should thank me, he says, because I could have told them that you hit me. Did you spot the masks of domination in this story? Anonymity. Bob claiming that it simply wasn't him. You had him confused with someone else. He wasn't the problem. Benevolence. Bob presenting himself as one of the good guys, only caring what people in authority thought of him and caring nothing for the person he hurt. Fragility. Bob claiming that you are the problem, not him. He asks to be rescued from the invisible threat he created in you. Civility. Bob claiming that you are the inappropriate one and you must be reined in. By acting like the more respectable party, he is saying your voice is not credible. And gaslighting, when you later confront Bob and you say, what were you thinking? And he said, you should thank him for not being more of a jerk. He's intimidating you into going with his strange and faulty logic and making you feel like you need to question your own perception of reality. The scariest domination, the most problematic domination, hides in plain sight. Now in this story, Bob was probably somewhat conscious of what he was doing. But what I want to talk about today is, can we use domination and not realize it? Yes. Several years ago, I was invited to be a judge at a business pitch competition. And I happened to be one of the only white people in the room. As a judge, it was my job to ask the entrepreneurs questions, which I did. At one point during the event, I raised my hand and asked one of the contestants a question that completely sucked the oxygen out of the room. For the purposes of this talk today, the question itself doesn't matter. What matters is the reaction. People shifted in their seats. People muttered under their breaths, shook their heads slowly. My fellow judges, both people of color, looked down at the desk. And after that event was over, not a single person wanted to look me in the eye. What was it about that question that caused that reaction? Was it my tone? Was it my posture? Was it my timing? Did I hit on a pain point that I didn't know was there? That question wasn't meant to be offensive, and perhaps out of the mouths of one of my colleagues of color, it wouldn't have been, but that question coming from me in that context reeked of domination. See, even those of us who mean well can wield power like a weapon and have no idea about the damage we're causing. Some of us have been so entrenched in domination, so familiar with its rule, that we can't see it when it stares us in the face. I have been conditioned not to see my own domination. So where do we go from here? What do we do about this? If our histories and our cultures and our norms have been soaked through with domination, what do we do about it? I'd like to offer three steps that we can take. Step one, we've got to identify it. We've got to admit and acknowledge when we see these patterns in ourselves, in our families, in our communities, in our beliefs, in our policies, in our practices, in our cultures, in our social systems and institutions. Unfortunately, that's rarely enough because many times when domination is exposed, it grows more oppressive. Which leads us to step two, calling domination to account. This is the uncomfortable process of speaking truth to power. Protesting, 
creating art and satire, preaching and poetry, changing our spending habits, and using our voice in day-to-day -day interactions. As we do this work, it is vitally important to remember that we can't overcome domination by using domination. That only feeds it. We have to dismantle it carefully, thoughtfully, sustainably, and we have to build something better. Which leads us to step three. We've got to share power. Because domination likes to hoard power, sharing power is the antidote. We look for existing models of sharing power, but if we can't find any, we've got to gather the full range of our creative imaginations, all of our faculties, and evolve the ways we work and relate and exchange so that all people can have the ability to use healthy power. I leave you with the following challenge. The next time you do or say something that sucks the oxygen out of the room, because you probably will, pay attention, acknowledge it, apologize, and make a conscious shift in that moment to sharing power. Because in that moment, you have an opportunity to help build a world where domination has nowhere to hide. Imagine what that world could be.